the evidence at trial proved beyond a reasonable doubt that this is a tormented and disturbed woman who will go to extraordinary lengths to wreak havoc upon other individuals, potentially subjecting them to life imprisonment in order to gain sympathy and notoriety for herself. Her story about the sexual assault in San Juan County in September 2012 was suspect in the very beginning. Two men whom she recognized, although she had not seen in over 20 years, gained access to her home at 8 in the morning, perhaps with a key she presumes was given to them by a family member. She is tied down and brutally raped and tortured for more than two hours. She chose not to report this crime to family or friends for several days. A friend observed what appeared to be bruising. It was still present a week or two later, and then she insisted that she inform the police. When Sarah indicated that she doubted that the local police would believe her, her friend insisted that she make a report to the St. Clair County Sheriff. Although she made the report to San Juan County Sheriff deputies, the interview took place at the St. Clair County Jail, which is why this case ended up in this court. Sarah gave descriptions that were so detailed that the interview went on for hours. There were so many specific recollections of the minute-by-minute -minute events that the investigating officers became immediately suspicious. She told the detectives that she had gone to Fort Huron Hospital shortly after the incident and gave them a release to obtain a report. However, the hospital confirmed that she had never been seen or examined at that hospital. The detectives requested that she have her bruising and lacerations inspected by the county medical examiner. The lacerations barely broke the skin and appeared to be more recent than the time claimed for the assault. When the doctor attempted to clean the wounds that were reported to be two weeks old, the bruises were easily removed by washing them with a gauze pad. The doctor left the examining room to inform the detectives and returned with them to find the bruises had miraculously reappeared. In question, she challenged them by telling them they could search her purse to see that she didn't have any makeup with her. Though not in her purse, the search of the wastebasket revealed the makeup kit. Nonetheless, the officers felt obliged to follow up with their investigation. Nothing at the home had any evidentiary value. Bedding and clothing allegedly involved was bundled and brought to the police. There were no signs of blood or stains. No evidence of forced entry, even though Sarah insisted that she had locked the door after having returned from dropping her kids off at school. The next step was to contact the alleged assailants. Kevin Patton is a social worker with the Community Mental Health Department. Records of that morning indicated that he was part of a weekly office meeting that lasted the entire morning. His presence at the meeting was confirmed by the director and the minutes of the meeting. Terry Stone is a partner in a construction company. Email communications and other office records attested to the fact that he was in his office miles away all day. Both of these individuals are mature men, well respected in the community, whose only connection to Sarah Weiland is that her ex-husband belongs to the same church, the Jehovah Witnesses, the church to which he is trying to bring their children over her objections. At this point, the San Juan County Sheriff decided to seek a warrant making a, for making a false report of a felony and tampering with evidence, that is, the concealment of the makeup kit. The venue was proper in St. Clair County since that is where the report was taken. However, the St. Clair County prosecutor recused himself in his office as they had prosecuted a case over 10 years ago in which Sarah Weiland was the alleged victim of rape in the parking lot of Meyer's store. Although there was a conviction in that case, the case was reversed by the Michigan Supreme Court this past year because the jury was not informed of an alleged false report in California that occurred after the alleged rape but before trial in Michigan. The case was assigned by the Attorney General to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. The California incident came into evidence in this case under MRE 404B. For about a year prior to Sarah's alleged sexual assault in Fort Huron, she had established by internet and phone conversations a relationship with a woman in California who headed a rape victim counseling service. In, 2000, in September 2001, Sarah traveled to California with her husband and parents to visit relatives. One day that month, Katina Amagonia, the woman whom she had 
damaged contact list, received a call from Sarah. Sarah claimed to have been sexually assaulted in the parking lot of a restaurant and asked for them to come and get her. Katina and her boyfriend, Nick Burrell, immediately drove two hours from their home in Fresno to Bakersfield to pick her up. She asked to be taken to their home, which they agreed to do. On the way, she asked to stop at an ATM machine. She insisted that Nick accompany her, but he refused to leave the car. The next day, while at work, as a crime scene investigator at the Fresno Police, Nick Burrell was informed that the Bakersfield Police were looking for him and his girlfriend in reference to a complaint of kidnapping. Sarah had called her husband and father and told them that she had been raped, that she had been abducted and was being held in their Fresno home. Nick called Katina and informed her of the allegations. Katina confronted Sarah, who simply rolled her eyes back and said, Sorry. Katina described the look on her face as maniacal. Nick then realized why she wanted him to accompany her to the ATM. He would appear on camera and she would have manufactured evidence to support her story. Sarah continued to assert that she had been raped in Bakersfield and she couldn't believe her bad luck as she had just been raped in a parking lot of a store in Michigan a month before. However, she indicated to the police that immediately after the rape, she had gone into the restaurant and had lunch with the family but didn't mention the assault. She had no explanation as to why she claimed to have been abducted other than she was under a lot of stress. No actions taken by the Bakersfield Police, but Nick Burrow insisted that a report be made to prevent any future claims against them. He believed that if he had not been a police officer, he would have been arrested. Deliberations were not long. Sarah Wyland was found guilty as charged with filing a false report of a felony and tampering with evidence of a criminal case punishable by more than 10 years. At the portrait of Sarah Wyland is not yet complete. Earlier this week, she appeared in the circuit court in Sandlot County and pled no contest to various charges, including larceny by false pretenses of $20,000 to $50,000, health care fraud, and use of a computer to commit a felony. These charges stem from her claims, from her claims of suffering from terminal cancer and actually obtaining treatment, including hospice care, by falsifying medical records. Despite her claim that her cancer is in remission, the facts show that she was never diagnosed with cancer and that she used the story to solicit tens of thousands of dollars through fundraisers on her behalf. Blue Cross Blue Shield is seeking over $100,000 in restitution in that case. These facts are necessary to review because under the sentencing guidelines, the minimum range for her conviction in this case is 0 to 17 months. As such, the case falls into the category of an intermediate sanction cell and requires a court, absent a departure, to impose a jail term of not more than 12 months, which is the recommendation. <coughs> Given the facts in this case, such a sentence would be a grave miscarriage of justice. This isn't a situation in which someone falsely reports a stolen car. Had her allegations been charged and she perjured herself, she would have been facing life imprisonment herself. Even though these men were not charged, the accusations circulated around this small community, and they were unresolved until her convictions. If the totality of these facts do not establish a substantial and compelling reason to, for a departure from guidelines, it is difficult to imagine what would. Nothing in the guidelines gives adequate weight to the diabolical nature, the methodical orchestrations, or the callousness of her treachery. She was willing to go so far as to self-inflict wounds, to corroborate her falsehoods, to carve into her far forearm the word slut. She had no reason to falsely charge these men. Had they not had airtight alibis, a factual question would have been presented, and they most likely would have been brought before a jury. As with most of these cases, it would have been a case of one person's word against another. One could only speculate whether the truth would have come out. Also, Sarah Wyman could play the victim one more time. The court finds that the sentencing guidelines are inappropriate in this case, and that prison sentences required to a 
attain the ends of justice. The premeditated nature of this crime is not adequately considered by the guidelines, nor is the extent to which she was willing to go to falsely accuse two men of a capital offense. Nor is there adequate consideration given to the guidelines for a person who has a history of making false charges of capital offenses or has the capability to commit massive frauds upon her. I see this woman sent to prison for her crimes to the travesty of justice. Sarah Wyland, for the crimes that you have committed before this court, I'm going to adopt the recommendation made by the prosecuting attorney. The charge of falsifying the report of the felony, your sentence to the Michigan Department of Corrections, for a minimum term of two years to a maximum term of four years. I am tampering with evidence for felony punishable by more than 10 years. Your sentence to a term of three years to the next for 10 years. And these terms are to be served consecutively. You are entitled to have both the sentence and the conviction reviewed as a matter of right by the Court of Appeals. And you'll be given a form before you leave here that outlines uh, those rights that your application for court appointed counsel and those who have retained counsel for trial in the court appointed attorney for purposes that will be provided to you. The Chicago Physics Support Board is now given that form. You are required to return that to us within 42 days to have the attorney for the body of the appeal. The standard uh, statutory cost assessments are included in the judgment sentence. Thank you very much, Ryan.